Welcome to another episode of Auto Mundial, where this week we take a look at some of the best new EVs from the Nissan Leaf and new VW ID4 to the outrageous new electric Hummer. We also have some family crossovers from Vauxhall and Renault. And some two-wheeled action courtesy of the gorgeous BMW R18. In the 1950s, British Formula One team BRM built a racing car like no other. With a supercharged V16 with a capacity of just 1.5 litres, it sounded like nothing else. And now, to celebrate BRM's 70th anniversary, they're building some more. Using up to 20,000 original drawings and blueprints of the original cars, a former team engineer will oversee the production of a handful of brand new BRM Type 15 V16s, using original chassis numbers set aside in period. Despite originally being piloted by the likes of Juan Manuel Fangio, the V16s didn't enjoy much success. But the unique noise of the 600 horsepower engines revving to 12,000 RPM made it one of the most iconic cars of the decade. Only three painstakingly authentic new cars are to be built, with one already assigned to the son of BRM's team principal. While family buyers used to opt for MPVs and people carriers, more and more of them are making the switch to crossovers and SUVs. Manufacturers are taking note and brands like PSA-owned Vauxhall are busily expanding their product ranges. This is the Crossland X Opal and Vauxhall's replacement for the Mariva MPV. It's a compact crossover designed with family buyers in mind. However, while it may be high riding with chunky SUV styling, it's only available with front wheel drive, so it's very much a road car. There's a bewildering array of trim levels to choose from, but you're best off getting something from somewhere in the middle of the range. Inside, it's all very practical. There's plenty of space and headroom throughout thanks to the boxy roof line, although the narrow rear bench would be a struggle for three adults. That said, it's likely most owners will be carrying children in the back, where they'll find it spacious, if a little dark and gloomy. The cabin is quite nicely trimmed with some soft touch materials and an optional panoramic roof. Dig a little deeper though, and the cheap feeling scratchy plastics are everywhere. There's little in the way of design flair, but it's a functional space with decent equipment. All models come standard with a leather steering wheel and a decent infotainment system. Android Auto and Apple CarPlay are built in, along with DAB radio and a Wi-Fi hotspot. The screen itself is nicely angled towards the driver, but it does sit quite low, meaning you'll need to take your eyes off the road to glance at it. The touch sensitivity is good though, even if the graphics are a little old school. There's a row of big buttons too to make navigating menus on the move a lot easier. So what's it like on the road? Well, it uses a similar range of engines as the Peugeot 2008 on which it's based, meaning a selection of petrol and diesel options. The one to go for is the highest output 1.2 litre turbocharged petrol motor. It's a commonly used engine across PSA products, but Opel and Vauxhall's engineers have done a great job of refining it, making it seem much quieter than it does in some of its French counterparts. It's a revvy little three-cylinder checking out 128 brake horsepower, not bad in a compact car like this. You're best off avoiding the lesser petrol motor if you do any sort of motorway driving, but the diesels are very economical on longer runs. However, if you do venture onto a motorway, you'll soon notice a fair amount of wind noise, highlighting the Crossland's lack of refinement. It's far better suited to town driving then, but how does it compare against its rivals? Well, in addition to its PSA stablemates, the Peugeot 2008 and Citroen C3 Aircross, the little Crossland X also has another French rival to contend with, the well-established Renault Capture. On sale since 2013, the Captur is well established in this class and has been subject to various tweaks and updates throughout its time on sale so far. 
And with this new one, the Captur is now the car to beat in this class. It looks far more upmarket than before, while its range of engine options has also been improved. Inside, the Renault gets a simple, clean dashboard with a smart infotainment screen. The whole cabin just feels a bit more modern and upmarket than the Crosslands, but it's still rather dark. But if it's a colourful cabin you're after, you might be better off with this, the new Nissan Juke. An acquired taste, perhaps. It certainly stands out in this class with its strange face and colourful trim. Built in the UK, the Duke comes with a 1.0-litre three-cylinder engine borrowed from the Micra, but don't let that put you off. It churns out 115 brake horsepower via either a six-speed manual or seven-speed auto box. It isn't particularly fast, taking well over 10 seconds to get from 0 to 62, topping out at 112 miles per hour. It may look quite similar to the old car, but this new Duke is more spacious thanks to its bigger wheelbase. There's more headroom too, making it feel much more like an SUV than the old car, which just felt like the jacked up hatchback it was. The refreshed cabin is a huge improvement too. It feels more modern than the Crosslands and airier than the Renaults. There are lots of sporty details like the flat bottom steering wheel and bits of red trim and lighting. It gets a bright central touchscreen with smartphone connectivity and a useful Wi-Fi hotspot. There's really not a lot separating these three cars, but it is the Renault that gets our vote. It looks great and has a decent cabin. Performance is somewhat lacking, but it makes up for it with plenty of kit and its more premium image. Following on from the launch of its new electric family hatchback, the ID3, Volkswagen has revealed the next car in its ID EV range, a Tiguan sized SUV called the ID4. Derived from the 2017 ID Cross concept car, the 4 continues VW's new ID series design language with a striking full width LED light bar at the front and a large windscreen similar to its siblings. While we must admit that we're not huge fans of the colour on this particular honey yellow example, it is a good looking car on the outside and in the cabin where you're greeted by a smart modern interior. Lots of bits have been borrowed from the ID3 with a 10 inch or optional 12 inch screen ambient mood lighting and a very cool driver's digital display. Measuring up somewhere in between a Tiguan and a bigger Tiguan Allspace, the ID4 has plenty of space inside despite the floor being full of batteries. Speaking of which, various sizes are available, with top spec cars getting a 77 kilowatt hour battery capable of up to 323 miles on a single charge. A 201 brake horsepower electric motor powers the rear wheels getting the SUV from 0 to 62 miles per hour in eight and a half seconds. The straight line performance may not seem that impressive against many of the other new EVs we've seen this year, but a more powerful all wheel drive version is on its way at some point in 2021. The ID3 hatchback meanwhile aims to fill the void left by the old e-Golf. As such, VW hasn't gone over the top with the futuristic styling instead making a car that still largely looks like a normal car. It just happens to be electric. With more and more EVs being sold each year, it's entirely possible that the ID3 may one day outsell the Golf, and the ID4 could eventually replace the Tiguan. VW is aiming to sell 3 million EVs by 2025, and with VW's loyal customer base built on dependable, sensible cars, we think models like the new IDs could well help the brand to achieve that goal. After the break, the return of the Hummer. Coming up, a 1,000 horsepower electric Hummer. First though.
electric cars. Love them or hate them, they're here and they're here to stay. And while there are numerous £100,000 options out there, there are still relatively few affordable choices. Thankfully, though, this one, the Nissan Leaf, is a great low-budget option. Well, low budget is a relative term, with prices starting at a smidge under 30 grand, but it's within the realms of many prospective EV evangelists. And while most manufacturers are only just starting to release or think about releasing electric cars, this is already the second generation Leaf. And while the old car was hugely popular among buyers, it did have its shortcomings, namely performance and range. These are the two key areas where the new model really needs to improve, so how has it got on? Well, let's start off with performance, shall we? Well, the motor is the same one from the old car, but there's a new heavy-duty inverter which has bumped the power up to 150 brake horsepower. 0-62 is now under 8 seconds too, so while it's still no hot hatch, it's definitely an improvement. Moving on to the range, that's also seen a boost. A new battery design has got it up to WLTP confirmed 168 miles. Again, a long way from Tesla numbers, but more than enough for your daily commute. On the road, the biggest change is the new e-pedal, which slows the car through regenerative braking when you lift off the accelerator. It's a weird sensation at first, not one you soon get used to, but can really start to enjoy. It's a whole new style of driving that leaves the brake pedal all but redundant. As geeky as it sounds, it's a real thrill when you see the little graphic telling you that you're gaining charge as you slow down. Sadly, however, motorway speeds still seem to hammer down on your range, as does going up steep hills. That's a shame because in all other areas, the Leaf is an excellent family hatchback. And that's always been the appeal of the Leaf. While many other EVs are gimmicky, the Leaf is just a normal car that happens to be electric, with a decent boot and plenty of passenger space. But if you do like your EVs to be a little out there, the BMW i3 still stands head and shoulders above the rest. First launched way back in 2013, it still looks brilliantly futuristic. With its two-tone paint scheme, wacky rear doors and beautiful so-called interior worlds, it's a truly lovely thing. Like the Leaf, though, the little BMW is best suited to town driving. While the top-spec i3S brings a welcome dose of straight-line performance, long-distance driving is best left to more expensive options, with a realistic range of about 125 miles. So how about this, then? The new Hyundai Kona Electric. On the face of it, it looks likely to be a real hit. Not only is it a compact SUV, but it has a greater range than we've been used to in affordable EVs. 279 miles is the official WLTP figure, and by all accounts, that seems to be easily achievable. Performance is on par with the Leaf, despite its 201 brake horsepower, although the power does feel like it's tapering off when you get to motorway speeds. But unlike its rivals, it can handle motorway driving without a dramatic drop in range. Like conventionally powered Konas, though, the ride does leave a bit to be desired. It can be crashy over potholes and never feels as soft and compliant as an SUV should. The cabin remains largely unchanged from internal combustion versions, which means a nice modern dash, plenty of soft-touch materials, good infotainment and a disappointing lack of space for passengers in the back. Cargo space is compromised too, with more capacity than a super mini but less than your average family hatchback. So is the Nissan Leaf still the go-to choice in the affordable EV class? For our money, no. The Hyundai Kona Electric has stolen its crown. It's modern, well-built, and its range makes it far more usable than the Nissan. Along with its sister car, the Kia e-Niro, it has delivered a hammer blow to the Leaf and has set the bar for new electric cars to come.
When you imagine a motorcycle cruiser, the likelihood is that you'll think of something like this, a Harley Davidson. For nearly 100 years, Harley has produced bikes like the Softail, the Sportster and the Touring for a more laid-back approach to riding a motorcycle. These bikes have an upright seating position with the legs forward and the hands upwards, allowing for easy rideability and shifting. And since the 1960s, the American brand has dominated the market, with a few attempts from Europe, aside from Triumph and Motor Guzzi, until now. This is the BMW R18, and it's safe to say it doesn't look like any BMW motorcycle we've seen in the last 15 years or so. In fact, the design philosophy is based on a bike BMW produced in the 1930s, the R5. In addition to this, the 1800cc boxer engine that the R18 is propelled by is the best part of a 100-year-old technology. But with the aforementioned 1.8-litre engine, the BMW is no slouch, with 91 brake horsepower and 117 foot-pounds of torque, but it's also not light at 345 kilograms fully fueled. It weighs about as much as a horse and is the largest bike the Bavarian brand has ever built. BMW has been teasing the R18 for about 18 months now, and it certainly caught the eye of onlookers due to its daring and different looks. The huge cylinders are really the most standout feature, each one extruding from the chassis like huge luggage panniers. They're fully chromed, as are most of the external engine parts, as well as the handlebars, brake and clutch levers, and the humongous twin exhausts that are impossible to miss. Elsewhere, there is gloss black paint with gorgeous hand-painted pinstripes along the fairing panels. The BMW badge is available either in silver or bronze, and there's no hiding the bike's huge engine with 1800cc inscribed on seemingly every panel. So what's it like on the road? Well, at 345 kg, you wouldn't expect it to handle like an S1000RR, but it really isn't too bad. Turning at low and high speed is effortless thanks to the low weight distribution and the high foot rests mean you can lean into corners. All the torque is at the bottom end between 2 and 4,000 revs, so it's very easy to ride with gear changes almost becoming unnecessary. There are three riding modes available, rock, roll and rain, which adjust the suspension stiffness and traction control. Alongside the traction control, other aids are cruise control, hill hold control, drag torque control for downshifts, ride-by-wire throttle, keyless ignition, cornering lights and combined ABS. So on paper it all seems pretty good, but it isn't without its sticking points. For one, there is no fuel gauge, which for a modern-day cruiser is a bit inexcusable. Also, while the ignition is keyless, the steering lock and fuel filler cap are not. And to add insult to injury, a lockable fuel filler cap is a £50 optional extra. Speaking of price and starting at £18,995, the R18 is on the steep side. That's before you've added on optional extras like heated grips reverse, the aforementioned filler cap and other mod cons. So while all in all a good bike, the R18 just misses out on a few bare necessities that make it a great bike. We've seen lots of new EVs this year, from the stylish little Honda e right up to the barnstorming Lotus Avia hypercar. But one new electric car we didn't see coming was this, the enormous 1,000 horsepower Hummer EV. Yep, you heard that right. Hummer is back with its wildest truck yet. A far cry from the old Humvee military vehicles, this new all-electric off-roader is the fastest, most powerful and greenest Hummer yet. Gone are the old asthmatic gas-guzzling engines, replaced instead by three electric motors, one at the front and two driving the rear wheels. The result, as estimated by the manufacturer GMC, is a 1,000 bhp and a frankly hilarious 11,500 pounds feet of torque, enough to tow a small continent and hit 60 miles per hour from rest in three seconds. 
Curiously, GMC has gone down the Jeep Gladiator roof with a convertible pickup truck body style, but if previous models are anything to go by, we can expect some more conventional hardtop options too. It may not have the traditional ground headlights and angular bodywork of its forebears, but it retains the classic Hummer lettering at the front and looks just as tough as ever. It also gets some boxy wheel arches and massive 35-inch tyres for extra off-road credibility. The cabin is thoroughly modern with a nod to the old H1 with a huge centre console between the front seats. There's plenty of tech on board, including the interestingly named What's to Freedom mode that unleashes the truck's maximum performance. But perhaps the coolest bit of sci-fi technology is the so-called crab walk function, which effectively allows the Hummer EV to drive sideways for maximum manoeuvrability. It also gets some adaptive air suspension that can raise or lower the car to help you get over whatever obstacle might be in front of you. Prices will start at a little over $112,000 when it goes on sale in the US next year, with cheaper models starting at $80,000 in 2022. Join us again next week on Auto Monday Out as we check out the stunning new Fiat 500.